uh, let's begin with the second part of this fantastic day, please. Thank you very much, Konsetau. So um, I will be introducing Pedro Mora, that is uh, he's a Lisbon-based comic scholar, he holding a PhD um, degree in comparative literature, an international PhD really from Belgium in Leuven and the University of Lisbon. His book, Visualizing Small Traumas, Contemporary Portuguese Comics at Intersection of Everyday Trauma, came out earlier this year from Leuven University Press. And presently is putting together in English an essay collection on experimental comics, on the experimental comics artist Ilan Manoa, and is also writing in Portuguese on Bordalo Pinheiro, that is the so-called father of Portuguese comics. He has been teaching history, theory, and script writing for comics, illustration, and animation since 2003 in several Portuguese institutions, and has also some international experience. Within the area of comics, he is very active, so working with museums, also as a TV documentarian, a podcaster, a bookstore gallery owner, published scriptwriter and critic, writing regularly for Portuguese and English language blogs, as well as, well as social networks. So before we move on, um, can you just say something about why so many different activities in comics? So it seems that you do everything, right? Can you just uh, comment? Do you mind that? if I, I think I'll stand up. I prefer to do that. And also let me control my time. So, first of all, uh, thank you. Não sei se posso falar em português, eu imagino que posso falar em português, mas imagino que a maior parte das pessoas não entenda nada. So, English imperialism it is. Uh, <laughs> just a joke. Um, thank you so much for having me and giving me this wonderful opportunity of having such a, a, a large moment of, of talking about, I will answer, okay? Uh, uh, about Portuguese comics. I'm always afraid of these situations because it's not a focused thing. It's not a paper that I'm presenting. So I'm always afraid of going all over the place. And after one hour, I didn't say anything substantial or interesting. That starts, for instance, with the images. I have a lot of images, but they're not organized in a way to show you like a, 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 a linear presentation, but I hope to show a few things if they are pertinent. Um, anyway, so, as for this question, I mean, I'm always a little bit afraid of this presentation because it looks like, oh, he's doing a lot of things, but there's a reason for that. There's no money whatsoever in any of these functions. So although, yes, I'm teaching, yeah, you know, okay, it's not bad, but it's not tenure track. And then I organize an exhibition and yeah, sure, it's paid, but thank you. Or I publish a book, but there's no money. So that's why I do a lot of things. Give me a job with a good paying uh, salary and I won't do anything else but that, but, but that job. And also that reflects a little bit the um, situation in Portugal, but then again, it's the same thing all over the place. It's not like, for instance, I studied in Belgium and a lot of people, uh, there's someone from uh, uh, Belgium here, and we have this idea, oh, it's incredible. There's comics all over. People love uh, uh, comics, it's everywhere. Uh, no. That's not absolutely true. So anyway, uh, I, I, I do try to do a, a few things because of necessity more than anything else. And also because it's a small country, so the comics community knows each other. So it's really, really, uh, it's not only a small country with a small population, but the community of comics is even smaller. And we know each other because we all go to the same festivals. There's, you know, three or four main publishers, even so they are small. So it's a, it's a very small, tight community. Um, one of the things that I would like to, uh, wait, my, I, I mean, I, I'm using glasses and this is really difficult, but. No, can I open with? No, it's okay. It's just that the camera will not grab you. No, 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 it's okay. No, no, it's it's fine, my, my supervision is working. So this is the, the book that uh, uh, it, it was published earlier this year uh, uh, from Leuven. And although 
the I mean, it, it was very interesting the presentation this morning because there were a lot of, a lot of themes in, in which I think that uh, uh, I would love to engage in because this is a book precisely, if I can sum up in a way, it's about uh, examples from Portuguese comics by certain artists, a little bit more independent, if you will, or experimental, if you will, that have responded to mainly all the social and economic problems after the 2008 financial crisis and how austerity uh, it appeared as a concept of organizing uh, our society and the political discourse. And there were a number of artists that responded to that through comics. But most of these, uh, uh, most of these works, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying works because I want to uh, say something in, in, a, in a moment, um, most of these works did not address things that would be known immediately as big traumas. Uh, this is more about everyday, uh, quotidian, um, ongoing, pervasive uh, situations that maybe do, they're not blunt in one moment, but they every day they, they uh, take out a little bit of people's autonomy or um, the, the, their, even their capacity of having a voice within the political discourse. And that's why I call these small traumas. So it's, in any case, it's a more or less a, a cross of trauma studies and comic studies to talk about these artists. I'm using the word works because some of these comics are not published in book form. And this, this is something that I would like, it's a little convoluted, but this is something that I would like to introduce exactly uh, about the, 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 the place of Portuguese comics within global comics. Because we still have to justify ourselves sometimes in, in certain circles when we are discussing comics, the first uh, chapter of this book is something that I would prefer not to do. It's something that, it, it, you know, in, in an ideal world, I didn't need to do, which is an introduction about Portuguese comics, about the context, the history, uh, what is its role, because in an ideal world, we would have access to that. You see, in, in cinema, for instance, if we can make a stupid comparison, of course, it's completely different in terms of economics, etc. But in cinema, we do have opportunity to see films from, I'm, I'm a little afraid of this word, but less central countries. So we do have festivals. We have uh, even sometimes within our own countries, we have a festival dedicated to a national film organized by the local embassy or the cultural center. So we do have some access. There's DVDs. Their subtitles. So, I mean, I know a little of, I don't know, uh, Russian cinema or Italian cinema, even though I do not speak Russian or Italian. However, for comics, it's either translated or it doesn't exist. So it's completely invisible. There's no, no circulation whatsoever. And even though there are sometimes a little efforts of uh, creating little entries of, of those other traditions, that does not mean that it will open the gates to uh, uh, translations of, the, of those countries. For instance, in terms of Portuguese comics, uh, there was a, a, a catalog in, uh, produced in the 90s called Le Maître de la Bande Désignée, about precursors of comics in, in Europe. And there was one uh, figure from Portugal, Burdal Pinheiro, which is a 19th century uh, artist. Um, and also, uh, Paul Gravett, as you know, has edited that massive book, 1001 Comics That You Have to Read Before You Die. And there is one title from Portugal. And although there is one title from Portugal, that doesn't mean that it, uh, it has not been translated so far into whatever language. Um, I'm not lying, am I? No. Uh, the author has been translated into Italian because he has a book about the history of Lisbon, but that book has, has been translated. So when there's no translation, it's really difficult to have this kind of circulation. So these are two things, language and also format. Because one of the things that I've been noticing, uh, and many of you have probably noticed this too, and most of you, if not all of you, are contributing exactly contrary to this, is that sometimes there is canon formation, 
right? There is a, a, this interest of talking always about the same artist. I have nothing, nothing against Art Spielman, Alison Bechdel, Chris Ware, but uh, can we have papers about other artists than not Chris Ware, Alison Bechdel, Spielman, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I don't know how, how, how many of you have had this experience. You're in your PhD program, your university, and you say, I'm studying comics. Oh, that's so interesting. I love comics. I have all Asterix at home. Well, I am talking more about adult comics. I know what I mean. <laughs> or you have people asking, have you ever read Mouse? And what I want to answer is, no, what's that? <laughs> oh, it's about the Holocaust. A comic about the Holocaust? <laughs> Very. Um, so it's really, there's all of these cliches that it's still, they're still true in, in to a certain extent. But it's up to us exactly to try to bring up new examples. So for instance, when I was uh, deciding uh, the theme, uh, of course, I mean, I hope that this is something that is a, a work that could be applicable, I, I don't like this word, but to other comics from all over the place, of course. But I thought that it would be important to bring up the, a little bit of unknown Portuguese comics to the to the center of uh, attention, of international attention, I mean. Um, so one of the, my problems is that canon formation sometimes also leads to, I don't know if I can say this, but canon formatting. So it, it's not only what uh, the objects that we talk about, but the kinds of objects that we can talk about. So there's this insistence that if, if there's no book form, then it's not interesting. So it has to be and for instance, I hate the, the, the difference that people do between comics and graphic novels. I, I don't read comics, I only read graphic novels. Okay, so I don't watch movies, I only watch cinema. It, it, <laughs> it makes no sense, it makes no sense whatsoever. So, and there are indeed many comics that do not exist in book form that are wonderful. Mel Gibson, for instance, is dedicating a, a lot of her work to wonderful comics that are under the radar, as Spidman says. So um, having said this, uh, it's important for me not to focus that much in Portuguese comics, but really on the, at the question about it's the role of Portuguese comics that could bring other things. So, but I know Portugal is not a central country. At the same time, it's not exotic enough to uh, warrant some, some attention. But then again, I know that there's been a lot of efforts, for instance, there's a Swedish anthology, a Romanian anthology in English, but that didn't mean that uh, those works have been translated or widely circulated. We all know that there are artists from our own countries or other countries that are completely unknown outside of their countries. Just to give you three examples, Andrea Paciencia from Italy, or Fabrice Nose Journal, it has not been translated. I don't know why, it, 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 although all of those things are incredibly central to so many discussions. Or even here in the UK, Melinda Gabby for me is the heroine of uh, underground comics and her work has not been collected into a graphic novel. If it, if it was, maybe it would bring her to another uh, role within uh, uh, comics mm -hmm. and not only as the companion of a famous art, uh, author, uh, which is also problematic. Anyway, so this is what I want to say uh, 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 in, in, as a huge introduction. And, and really, I would prefer you to ask any questions or so I can show you a few things. Because I do have a presentation here, for instance, about the history of Portuguese comics. And, you know, I can start with medieval codices and show, oh, there was already comics in the Middle Ages that, that used Portuguese and it has... Uh, panels or something from, I don't know, prehistory. We do have uh, engravings from prehistory that have certain techniques of animation, if, if, if you want. So I could bring that typically as those divulgation books about the history of comics are always taking examples from other circles to, uh, what's the word, ingratiate? I don't know, but, you know, to bring a, a little bit more glory into the history of, of national comics. But we have a tradition, like many other European comics, that starts in the 19th century, associated with you know, the mixture of comics, cartoons, where that difference 
made no difference. I mean, people were just working and, and doing things with uh, graphic examples. Sorry, so history, no. Uh, Okay, you see, I, uh, these are examples that you can try to do that, that open-ended history and picking up things from uh, any moment in history. Well, this is not organized chronologically, I see. Okay, anyway, so we have the, the magazines from the 19th century. This is already Bordal Pinhais. And then it goes on and on. But I don't want to go into this because it would take a long time and I would uh, prefer to have a conversation with you. So anyway, um, apart from this, an history that is very much like other countries, modernism brought a lot of individual artists that did very interesting graphic work. I would, I would probably say that because Portugal was not a very rich country in producing comics in the sense of having, uh, you know, magazines and big publishers, we are, a, we are a country with more individual authors than schools. I don't know if this makes sense. You know, more or less we can say, oh, there's the school. Of course, there's always extraordinary, outstanding artists in those schools, but you can talk about a, more or less a group, you know, like we, we talk about in France, or sorry, French Belgium comics, the Col de Marcinelle, the Col de Bruxelles, et cetera, that kind of thing. 2000 AD style, that kind of thing. In Portugal, it's more individualistic, although they have responded to history. As you know, we had 48 years of the dictatorship. So during that time, comics were uh, very pedagogical, didactic, and, 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 and producing discourses, uh, uh, defending the Portuguese regime, our colonialism that lasted until 74. Uh, with the wars, etc., and then after that, we started to have a little bit more uh, individualized artists doing psychedelic work, authorial work, but of course with no money. So the the magazines uh, don't have that much circulation. Today, we we have a better market, but let's say that it's more tailored to more commercial comics than authorial comics. There's it's it's a it's a huge gradation. So I cannot say that there's only one style you know sometimes people ask that kind of thing uh sorry what's what's written there no that's not what i want to show uh, so I, I this is really random okay so these images are not that organized and i just want to show you some of our, the artists that i think are interesting today of course that i lean more to the authorial experimental comics and the most mainstream. There are Portuguese artists, for instance, working for Marvel, Dark Horse, DC, but I mean, uh, with all due respect, I know these people personally, but for instance, the artists that are working for DC, they're interchangeable with any other artists working for DC. You know, high realism, a lot of the details, et cetera, but they're not particularly different. For the ones that are working for Marvel, on the other hand, it's a little bit more um, individualistic styles. But that that would lead uh, that would lead us into a discussion about DC and Marvel. That although they are both mainstream houses, they have different different styles. But but that also opens up this idea of globalization. So you have artists in Portugal, in Odivelas, you know, the Banlieu, and they are uh, doing uh, Spider-Man comics, and just like any other uh, artist working there. So you see here some images from abstract comics, etc. So, sorry, um, taking too long. I would really prefer uh, to answer questions or uh, other things, and I do have some material that I can show to illustrate those points, but I would prefer to be a, a a dialogue. So I don't know if anyone wants to ask something, please. I was just wondering, thinking about what you said that um, a lot of Portuguese artists don't uh, reach an international audience. Aren't there any um, initiatives to, um, I'm not remembering right now, but there's an Italian uh, publisher 
who publishes in Italian, but then adds asterisks on, on the... Canicola. Yeah, Canicola Edizioni, yeah. Isn't there an initiative like that in yes. Portugal? Yes, ah, okay. Silicon Carn. Have you ever heard of Silicon Carn? So it's <laughs> not working. <laughs> it's, it's, trans, it's, it's in Portuguese or, excuse me, but for instance, this book is... Uh, oh, actually, this is one of the ones that is not translated. So sorry. Yeah. This is from Chile Concarne, but it's only in Portuguese. Chile Concarne, for instance, is a, a, a publisher that does exactly that. They have English translation, or sometimes the book is in English and it has Portuguese translation, even though it's a Portuguese uh, author. And they do that. And there is some circulation, but it's within a very specific sphere. For instance, um, if you are familiar with Canicola, Canicola knows about Chile Concarne, and Chile Concarne knows about Kuti Kuti, and Kuti Kuti knows about Canicola. So there's, you know, Strip Burek. There's a, a, a kind of, a, and I discussed that also in the book, there is a network of independent uh, alternative channels, and these people know each other because they publish each other, they meet in festivals, but this does not go into the mainstream audience. Of course, mainstream audience, when, I don't want to uh, talk bad about mainstream because all kinds of generalizations are always bad, but there is naturally uh, an interest by mainstream of mainstream texts or mainstream styles. And these kind of things really rarely enter that, that, that attention. And there are some programs, for instance, in Portugal, like in many other European countries, where you have an institute that pays for the translation or pays for the publication abroad of another book. For instance, sorry. for instance, uh, this is just for, for me to flex. This is my graphic novel. I mean, I'm, I'm the uh, script writer. Unfortunately, I brought the Polish edition. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> to offer Concession over, it's no Polish, so I got it wrong. But for instance, you see there's here the, the, the seal of the support. So this was paid for by the Portuguese. It was not the, uh, thank you, Timof, but it, it, the money came from Portugal to have this published. So there are those programs, but it's not enough. It's not enough. It has to do also with the attention in channels. And it, this always depends, for instance, when, uh, when we, you were discussing about the Spanish comics, about where it comes from, etc. That's very important because it also depends on the kind of reception that you have in newspapers and television. And in Portugal, for instance, there's, I mean, not that there's no reception, but it's very rare to have mainstream reception. So uh, there is, for instance, there are no major newspapers has a part to discuss comics, even though there are comics that would be quite interesting to a larger audience. I mean, there are some excellent, let's say, classic uh, comics about history, politics, or anything. I, I'm not. I'm not saying that it has to be. You know, I don't know. Um, you understand what I mean? I mean, something that would cross over to a. a, a, a but there's no big reception. Uh, there is one author now that has been published by Dark Horse, Flip Mel. And the book has been optioned for a Netflix series. And of course, a lot of people, oh, we're so happy. Yes, of course, I am happy for, for, for the artist. But I know that there's, that does not mean at all that now people from Netflix are rummaging through uh, Portuguese comics. Where's the next? Because I know that's not how it works. It's, it's different. Please, Jorge. Thank you, Pedro. Um, a couple of questions. I mean, you mentioned in Portuguese comics, is more like specific authors and there are no schools. Um, and, and I'm thinking as well, your, your reference to the, the long period of the dictatorship and how comics were very much didactic and you know, promoting ideals of the dictatorship and so on. I cannot help but compare it with the case of Spain and how during the dictatorship, there were different schools associated to certain publishing centers like Barcelona or magazine like, or yeah, publishing centers or, or Bruguera or different magazines, etc. And those um, costumbristas comics or local folklore, you know, through humor, they depicted what it was like in Spain many times. And there was certain critique as well. Um, so that didn't happen in Portugal with the comics, in, using humor to depict everyday occurrences, uh, situations, uh, struggles. 
There are, I don't know if I have the, you see, I have to jump back and forth and I'm sorry for that. Okay, I, I really can't read from here, but let's start with this one. Okay, so for instance, th these are the comics that were done in the, in the 1920s, you see? This is the first time that Tantan -tan was ever translated to another language. It was wow. in Portugal. So it looked promising, but <laughs> then it didn't go anywhere. So for instance, this series, it's called Kim mm -hmm. and Ekish, and it's done by Stuart Carvalhais. Stuart Carvalhais is an artist. I mean, as you probably know, because this happened everywhere, the modernists uh, generation were people that did everything, you know, painting, cinema, music, and comics were just part of that language. So it was nothing separate. So I'm not doing comics. The thing is, there was no money involved. So many of these, they were picadillos of uh, youth, and then they stopped uh, doing comics. You, we can argue a little bit that the kind of humor, because these are street kids, a little bit like we can fluke it, maybe, but they are poorer. But those things were never thematized in a very um, clear way. So it was just, uh, I mean, sometimes they have jokes at the expense of the stupid street policeman, for instance, but it was never anti-authoritarian uh, precisely. It was just light humor. And I think that that happened in the 30s and 40s, but uh, after, uh, after a while, most of the things conformed. So this is always that style. For instance, this is Carl Jugutello. This is a one page cartoon slash comic. And it's almost, it's a weekly thing. And it's a little commentary about morals in Portugal. So, you know, uh, people would, there's one recurring character, character who is always spitting in the floor. Unfortunately, this is some tradition that has not gone away yet in Portugal, of uh, man spitting. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of, of, of uh, jests about that kind of behavior, but it's never about the state. Or they may talk about a little something that happened, but it's never open criticism. So there was really this uh, ingrained thing, uh, for instance, um, we were, you were discussing about Cuba, that when you're working in an environment, uh, you never know if one of your colleagues is an informant. We have a word for this, is pidesco, because we had the PID, the, the, not secret police, but the state police, and pidesco, you understand the adjective, right? So, and it was typical that you never, the, there's this um, uh, sentence, the walls have ears. This is very common because there was really um, a culture that was uh, increasingly, it, it became even worse and worse and heavier as we uh, passed the 50s and the 60s. So it was, I mean, I, I was born, <laughs> I'm, I, I have no experience whatsoever of the, the dictatorship, of course, but talking to people, it seems that it got worse in the 60s and the 70s because it really started, the paranoia settled in. So you never knew who, who would say uh, things. But uh, by, I don't know if you know about this miracle, but after the 25th of April in 1974, so when we had democracy, the peach, the peach disappeared. No one, no one ever belonged to peach. No one was arrested, no one was, it was a miracle, it disappeared. So we had 48 years of fascism and the day after, we all believed in democracy and in socialism. So it was very beautiful. It's a case study about, the, <laughs> about that. Um, I could continue with bad jokes about this. Um, so the, the thing is, most of the stories were really um, uncritical. For instance, the stories about the, for instance, about, the, the, about adventurers, in Africa, for instance, there's, I can't remember the name of this year, but there's, there's one sentence, it's hilarious because it's one of these explorers arriving at a, a small African village, a typical African village. And, and the sentence is sent, uh, say something as simple and as beautiful as a Northern Portugal village. Understand? So the comparison is because one of the things that Salazar, uh, 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 really uh, managed to ingrain in our brains that 
we are poor, but honored and clean and Christian and respectful and moral. So, but, and this idea still continues a little bit today. I don't know if you agree, but there's a little of, of behaviors that Pop, still continue. Pobrezinhos, mas honrados. Pobrezinhos, mas honrados. So, you know, poor, but with honor. Yeah. Um, so I think that most of, the, uh, of these things were not at all critical. To the point, actually, that even after the 25th of April, there's one, one of our first graphic novels, one of the first books, book length uh, uh, comic. It's actually, it was done by an ex-combatant, an ex-soldier, military, slightly anonymous, that is a defense of colonialism. So the war has ended, the countries, um, Angola and Mozambique were already uh, democratic uh, uh, regimes and, and independent. And there was this book talking about how they were terrorist countries and how we should continue uh, our presence in the book after the 25th of April. That, that is an interesting book. Please. Hi, thank you. Um, really interesting what you're talking. And I wanted to go back to some of the first things that you said uh, on your presentation about this idea of sort of this sort of big names in comics or graphic novels when we're gonna get over them, um, hopefully soon. Uh, and I think it's interesting now that actually some of the work that is being in US, for example, academia is more theorizing uh, rather than just, you know, um, paying attention to individual works and so on. But I wanted to uh, go back to your idea of sort of those small traumas mm -hmm. uh, and some of those small narratives or, how comics or graphic novels actually deal with those little events, right? That you uh, can think about the quotidian or the daily experience and so on. And you could definitely see that, that the language of comic is actually quite, it seems to be very fertile in that aspect. So for example, in the US, a lot of the artists that are starting to publish have to do with like questions of identity, questions of memory, very small stories as well, right? So when you think about those small stories, that sort of the intimate way of relating personal stories and they're very localized and you think about a more wider audience. So how do you translate that, right? So you could have a very localized, um, intimate sort of personal stories, also very much affected by the quotidian, which clearly has to do with the way that you live and interact with your own space, that appeal for a wider audience when you move away from historical events like the Holocaust or the disappeared or, or so on, right? So then your understanding of that market to circulate a product like that, while the product itself is so localized, right? So you're talking about local artists and so on, how do you think that could be combined? I mean, is that, it, it, it's coming to be localized that way? Is that a way to make that more of a, I don't know, a, a language or a way of practice that can be shared? Uh, what, what's your view on that? Well, first of all, I'm not a marketeer, so I would not be able to say exactly what kind of strategy you have to use to, uh, you know, I, I really well, don't know. No, no, sure. And, and I think that, uh, uh, for instance, one thing is that if, if artists or authors start to think, oh, I should not be as local as because I want this to be to have more universal appeal, that's the wrong way. I really think that if you're anchored to a very specific situation, localized, it, I think that if the human experience is true, and strong, it will appeal to the readers. Now, but we know that the economy of attention, it's really, um, it, it's, it's not a two-way street. We know that there are centers of production. We know that the United States, France, Belgium, and Japan are huge centers of comics. They produce a lot of comics that are translated to other languages. And we know that even between those centers, it's not the same, uh, the, the same, uh, I mean, for instance, Curto Maltese, Asterix, for me, as a Portuguese, it's absolutely central. But most Americans, they don't even know this, right? Or, but superhero comics, it's also central in Portugal. I know a lot about, uh, uh, but for instance, I remember talking to uh, 
the leading uh, comic scholars, Anne Miller, she, she doesn't read superhero comics. And she was asking, why do you have so interested in this? And I said, because I, like Obelix, I fell into the cauldron when I was a kid. So of course, I mean, yes, yes, I'm reading uh, contemporary philosophy about li neoliberalism. What, a Spider-Man movie? <laughs> there I go, I mean, I can't resist. It's really a, 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 a thing of, it's a whole package. So it's not only a question of text, it has to do also with a lot of other, the context, etc. And Portugal, if you allow me, Portugal, because it's really, a, as I say in my book, a semi-peripheral country uh, or production of comics, we have comics from all over, either translated or in the original language. So, you know, an average comics reader in Portugal will have a fairly good knowledge about Italian comics, Spanish comics, English, American, French, Belgian comics, or Japanese. And now Korean, for instance, or I don't know, uh, German comics, if, if, if they have a circulation within the language that uh, people understand. Um, so, uh, also, uh, the other thing has to do, of course, with um, social media. So as you know, uh, Many people are working today in Instagram. Instagram is incredibly an incredible tool for, for, for comics. And I know that there are a few, for instance, a few Portuguese artists that are doing work that has some following, international following, but not enough, not enough. Not enough in my point of view, of course, because the, uh, 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 this is just a wish that people would know about that artist because I know that language, I know this person, I know that work, but I'm absolutely certain that each and every one of you knows about an artist from uh, another country that I don't know about and you would love for me to know. That's what these papers are for, you know, for us to be attentive to other traditions. Um, and there was something else that you asked that I should respond and I completely forgot. No, I, I was thinking more of like sort of that question thinking about why do you have that natural that Can you, can you give me any example? Like for example, you know, the Asian experience mm -hmm. or, you know, like very small stories are not very known artists. Like even, even from the outside, you see the U.S. as a dominant player, you also have very skilled production. That's why it's touching people's appeal for this kind of practice. touching very small sort of Names of, um, of, you know, identity narrative, um, personal um, stories, you know, it, it really, you know, it's not just something else, right? Why it was just so popular, right? Because you really have that call from the experience that they need that, you know, sort of. So I think it's a small story of mine. In ways that, by definition, will not be, might not be able to connect. I, I think that has to do with uh, huge issues, right? About representation, identity, and editorial choices. For instance, you, you're, you're referring to the Asian American experience. For instance, do you know Stargazing, uh, the, the book about the two young girls? For instance, I had that book in my bookshop and I was able to, to sell it regularly to younger readers, mostly women uh, or girls. And the thing is, I am almost certain that a book like that would never be translated into Portugal because the Asian Portuguese experience is not big, right? We don't have, we do have uh, 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 Asian communities or Asian descent communities, but it's not, uh, if I can say this, sufficiently strong or big to warrant translating that kind of books. Or, I mean, I don't know if there will be in 10 years, hopefully, books about that experience, about Portuguese Asian uh, experience, of course, but at this moment, that doesn't exist. 
But then again, that also happens within countries. For instance, Mel Gibson dedicates herself to uh, girls' comics, right? And you see, I mean, I'm sure that this afternoon, I don't know if in the story, we will probably see archival editions of 2000 AD, Judge Dredd, everything in big books. Why, the, why does that warrant an archival deluxe edition and not the ballet comics? Because it is a sexist uh, uh, thing that comics are mostly defended, discussed, et cetera, et cetera, by a male-oriented group. For instance, a, a typical thing when you walk, I mean, tell me if you don't have this experience. I hope I'm not lying. We're going to watch a movie. I'm with my girlfriend, whatever. And we look at the movie and there's Top Gun. And I think, hey, do you want to see Top Gun? Yeah, it's a universal movie. Everybody loves Top Gun. But there's this romantic comedy. Oh, no, that's a chick. So this is a film for women, but Top Gun is a universal uh, thing. That's wrong, right? But we know that, that that kind of pressure exists. So it seems to me that that it also has to do with that kind of identity. For instance, in Portugal, precisely. More quickly, you will see, um, I mean, look at me, I, I belong to the most mainstream cisgender uh, male, et cetera, group in Portugal, but all of the people that, most of the people that work in blogs and that kind of thing will fall into a category that they are still talking about the comics that are 40, 30, 50 years old. You know, Court Maltese, Asterix, all the classics. And every time there's a new book, like Tilly Walden's, for instance, it's silence. Even though there's, um, you know, the Tamaki Cousins published, uh, what's, One Summer? Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Finalmente uh, Oral. For instance, that book was translated in Portuguese, and it was almost radio silence about the book. It, sell, it, it sold very well, and people buy the book and love the book, but there's no chatter about it. There's no... Uh, public reception about that book. So I think that there's a, 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 a huge distance between what people are reading and the, the way they vocalize. And the most vocal defenders or discusser, uh, people that discuss about comics, it's always a little, bit, a, a little bit more mainstream, classic. And they are also making editorial decisions. So of course, they will not take that kind of examples. I don't know if this answered. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm yeah, yeah. That by belonging to a market, it doesn't yeah, yeah. something about what sort of narrative it's creating its own niche. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. I don't know if anyone has other questions. I'm sorry, I, I, as I said, I, this was not a focused thing, but it's really difficult for me because I could only talk about contemporary Portuguese artists or only about, I don't know, uh, younger artists that are doing experimental work or people that are using, for instance, strategies that come from internet-based or digital-based uh, technology and are changing a little bit the, the way that they use, distribute and construct comics. Or I could talk about uh, uh, the old regime and representation. Uh, of uh, one, one Please, comment please. and one question. Um, the comment is, maybe we need to rethink about these ideas that predominantly comics are read by male readers. Maybe we need to challenge that. Uh, we need to probably see current figures to actually corroborate that is, whether that is true or not. And it may not be indicative, but in this room there are 11 female colleagues and eight male colleagues. Sure. That's something to think about. No, I didn't and say that, that it is. Right, no, just... Just to rethink that, because I know that has been the predominant narrative, but maybe nowadays, especially if we look at other traditions, we're focusing on Portuguese, but if we look at manga and things, the, the, the readership is quite diverse by white. And, mm -hmm. and a question for you. you. You implicitly critique artists who work for the American market, mm -hmm. implicitly was my opinion, well, my impression. Ah, because of the style. They work, yeah. Because of the style, they work on that, and, and, and they cannot develop their own style. And, and that was a hindrance, so that was, um, you know, an obstacle to develop uh, themselves as authors. But maybe we need to think about what do we think about authors? I mean, 
comics is a craft as well. Mm -hmm. And as any other profession, you know, if an author can work for the American market and earn, you know, uh, the wages and live out of that, well, so be it. I mean, sure. Um, yeah, maybe I was a little bit moralistic in the way I said it. It's just that it's the re it's really important for me that you notice if if an artist grows into their own style. And what I feel is that some, not all, but some of the artists really try to emulate a school style. You know, so it's almost um, interchangeable. I mean, but what is the problem? What is the problem with that? I mean, that has been yeah. done throughout history, you know, sure. imitating mimesis sure. and artists copied other artists and, and there were schools created out of that. And an artist who can really emulate all the big names, you know, in the field of comics <clears throat> and American, whatever, you know, hats yes. off, hats off for that. I mean, for being able to do that, not, not many people can actually master, you know, a certain style. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, for, for me, it's just aesthetically, it's not pleasing. And critically, it's, it, it doesn't elicit in me an interest in discussing that work. So I can show it, of course, say, here, here's an artist, but it will not make me uh, reflect about what this person is doing. But that's me. It's my attitude. I'm not going to hide that attitude that it's, you know, this or that is the same thing. And for me, that's a little bit uh, weak. I don't know. Maybe it's not the, 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 the right word. I am criticizing. So you mentioned the, coloni the colonial experience and how even after it, um, the, you talk about this comic that still was insisting in the same colonial perspective. And I'm interested, for example, in Angola, because as you know, Cubans had participation sure. in the war in Angola. So I wanted to, how, is there any, any artist that has this kind of different perspective about the relationship between, you know, Portugal and Angola? There is uh, something that, that escapes that, you know, what you said, that, that way of reinforcing colonial stereotypes and all that. Do you know anybody who wears that kind of, because when I was in Lisbon, I noticed there was a lot of uh, restaurant club with, with, you know, from in a lot of migration from Africa and all that. So is there anything, any artists interested in portraying this kind of contacts between Portugal and Angola in a different kind of way than, you know? But now you mean? Yeah, right now. Yes. Right I, now, or if you know about, you know, anybody. Um, I, I honestly don't know anything about uh, comics in Portugal. So whatever you say is going to be new for me. As you can imagine, that is a very loaded question, and it's a very complex situation. I know. I, and I would have to have um, more um, to buttress my discussion in stronger, uh, a stronger ground. But th this is a very generalistic thing that I, will, I would say. Only recently, we have started to bring the discussion about the colonial wars into a more popular arena. Uh, if you allow me to give you an example, a, a very of personal course. example. My father was in Mozambique during the war. Um, and I have discussed nothing about that with my father, ever, ever. Just a little bit, not that much because silence is the most uh, typical thing about, about this. But this is true in any other phenomenon, right? There's a, a moment of silence and only another generation starts. So although I am a son of the, the generation that were in the colonial wars, we do not discuss, we don't know, we don't know much, but recently you started to have, you know, the film, soap opera, a comic, a book that thematizes the, the, the colonial war in ways that are different from pedagogical discourse. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. Of course, if you look at literature, there were always uh, uh, things happening, but not in comics. And comics now, you have a few people that are doing things about the colonial wars, not precisely about Angola, but could be uh, uh, anything. For instance, 
this book, this book, Gente Remota, it's, it's, it's a complicated book because it's almost, uh, uh, it's one older man, it's one older man talking uh, to, he's, he's very old, 70, almost 80, and he's in, a, in his house, he's retired, and he has, he has a, a, a black servant. And the things that he tells to this black servant from Cabo Verde, you know, it's that kind of things that I, uh, this is really dangerous what I'm, I'm going to say, because he's trying to reuse the same racist principles back uh, in the colonial, but, but the, the, that kind of discourse of positivity, you know, we brought you a language and <laughs> culture yeah. and that kind of thing. Why don't you speak proper Portuguese? She's, she's speaking in Creole, of course, or she will speak in Portuguese, but with a typical Cap Verdean accent. And he said, why don't you speak proper Portuguese? And this book, you retell some of the things that happened in, in the war, including war crimes uh, that are particularly horrible, but we don't discuss that openly. So this is a book, for instance, that tries, but there's no resolution here. So there's no justice uh, 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 applied to, to this character. But this is one of the things that I thematize in the book about the small trauma, because one of the typical things that there's no, it's not a, a three act thing where you have a resolution at the end, it continues. So uh, actually I use Sian the guy's ugly feelings, you know, the kind of a very flat thing that is always occurring. So there are some books that have tried to talk about the colonial war. Some are a little pedagogical, but there are now, uh, for instance, there's one very popular, but it's almost, it's like, you know, Predator, like the, the original movie, it's like Predator, but in Angola. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's just a group of soldiers. They have to go somewhere and one by one is killed by a fantastical being. And in the end, they discover it's a vampire, something like that. So yes, it's in uh, the war, but it's not thematizing I am criticizing again <laughs> the choice of the artist, but it's 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 an interesting book, but it's not bringing um, to the front these traumas. This one is, but it's not solving it in a way. And, but I think it's also important to have this kind of discourses because it's it's still an open wound in our own, our own contemporary history. Oh, but but you would say you said that mm -hmm. there is not uh, still a kind of. Um, historical memory identity work dealing with that trauma of the colonial war in a more personal way, in a more, you know, autobiographical, testimonial, anything like that, looking at it that- It's being done now. Oh, it's it, being done now. Let me give you an example. It's another discussion. We had, there's a museum that's going to open and the idea was to call the museum, the Museum of Discoveries. You can imagine the discussions that came along with that. So the, the discussion about this museum, for instance, is one attempt of discussing. As you can imagine, most of the older men uh, that lived through this or they uh, uh, through the war, they don't want to remember many of the things that it, it's, it's very complicated. I've, I've seen, there's a lot of people working with poetry, for instance, testimonial and poetry workshops with ex- uh, ex-soldiers, etc. So that's being done now, but it's still an ongoing process, mm -hmm. very painful for the people that participated and uh, for uh, what does Marion Hirsch calls it? The post-memory post generation in a way. So if, if I can consider myself someone belonging to that, but it's si radio silence. I don't know. I know that my father has some documents at home. I've never seen them, you know photographs, photographs, it's uh, never seen. And I'm al almost 50. <laughs> so it's not like this was yesterday. Right, thank you so much. Uh, and, and I'm also interested because where I live, we have a huge Portuguese community, a huge Cape Verdean community. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there is a lot of interest, of course, in these specific communities to uh, preserve uh, those kind of memories. And I do see conflict between the mainland Portuguese and the Caribbean and the Azorean communities. I see that every day where I live. So that's why I was, I, I wanted to, to see if there is sure. something, you know, uh, in terms of comics that deal with that experience. Can, can I just say one more thing? Sorry, because I, I, 
I am participating in a kind of a mentorship that is being done now by a, a conglomerate of publishers from Portugal, uh, Angola, and Mozambique to coordinate authors from Mozambique and Angola to do books. So I'm, I'm being the mentor of a small team to women that are doing comics uh, in, uh, um, in Mozambique. But what they're doing is a very fantastical thing. So it, it, it thematizes local culture, but it's a complete, you know, fantastical thing. I am not going to say that they should not do that or that, oh, you have to work with this and that. But there is, it's, it's a slow process because comics are still, because the money is also in more fantastical thing, more commercial uh, leaning uh, kind of works in order to get, to get that kind of language. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I think that it, we, we will still have to wait 10 to 20 years to have bulky, juicy comics about those things. We have probably five minutes more. So is there any other question or do, do you want to sum up um, what we have been saying? I didn't say anything. So, <laughs> so or do you want to add anything? No, thank you for having me. And I can leave the images with everyone. So if, Maybe I can, you can, we can send the images to everyone. And if someone has a picture, uh, a question about a specific work, please write me an email or we talk outside. Thanks.